Boldwood presents The House by the Sea, written by Louise Douglas and read by Emma Powell. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One I was walking the dogs along the footpath beside the River Avon when my sister, Martha, called to tell me that Anna de Luca had died. It was April. The air was cool, the tide was out, and I was alone. The dogs sniffed the grassy fringes of the path, while I held the phone to my ear and listened as Martha described how my former mother-in-law had passed away peacefully in a sunlit room in a hospice in South London. As she spoke, I watched a boy cycling towards me. He was fourteen or fifteen, dark-haired, slightly built. He could have been Daniel. I stepped aside as he passed. He stood on the pedals to keep the bike steady, leaned over the handlebars and nodded his thanks. He was wearing school uniform, rolled up shirt sleeves, a jumper tied around his waist, black shoes with scuffed toes, mud on the knees of his trousers. His cheeks were flushed with exertion. It was a lovely room. Martha said, and Cece said the staff were angels. She said it was a good death. All the family were there. I watched the back of the boy cycling away from me. The jumper flapped behind him. Edie? Martha asked. Did you hear me? I would have liked to tell her about the boy who looked like Daniel, but I knew if I did she would make the face she always made when I told her about something that reminded me of my son. Even though I couldn't see her, I'd know that was what she was doing. A silence grew between us. Martha was expecting me to say that I was sorry about Anna's death, or to ask her to pass on my condolences to Cece. But I couldn't. I simply couldn't bring myself to say it was all for the best, or that at least it was an end to Anna's suffering or some other cliché. I'd spent ten years picking at my hatred for Anna, and the wound was deep and bloody. I could hardly say something kind about her now. I watched the boy on the bike riding through the tunnel made by the overhanging branches of trees. He went around a bend and disappeared. Was Joe there? I asked. Sorry? Was Joe with Anna when she died? Yes, I just said all the family were. He spent a lot of time with his mother over the last few weeks. I expect she was asking him for forgiveness craving his reassurances. I could imagine him holding her trembling hand, telling her that what had happened to Daniel wasn't really her fault, and she, oh, she'd be doing her best to believe him. But deep down, she must have known Joe was only saying those words because he loved her. In her heart, she must have known he didn't mean it, because it was her fault. She was responsible for us losing Daniel, and even if Joe said he forgave her, it wouldn't be true. Daniel was his son as much as mine. How can anyone forgive the unforgivable? I looked back towards the city, hoping I might catch sight of the boy on the bike, but I couldn't see him. Edie, are you okay? Martha asked tentatively. Was that the boy? Was that him over there, cycling on the other side of the river? Edie? No, it wasn't him. Only some man on a road bike. Edie? Yes, I'm fine. Another pause, and then in a less tentative tone of voice, Martha said, Cece asked me to tell you that the funeral's next Thursday at the crematorium. We could go together. You will come, Edie, won't you? I don't think it'd be a good idea. At least think about it. It will be progress for you, closure. It might help you put everything behind you and, you know, move on. Move on? No, I didn't want to move on. How could I want to do anything that would mean leaving my son behind, forgetting him? Martha talked and I half listened, letting my mind wander, watching the two dogs side by side, cautiously sniffing at a piece of timber brought up by the tide. Sanderlings and avocets were feeding on the great slopes of pewter-coloured mud that reflected a low grey sky, trailing scribbles of bird prints below the tideline of driftwood and plastic. High above, gulls spiralled beneath the underside of the suspension bridge. 
I would not go to Anna DeLuca's funeral. I didn't want to see Joe again. He wouldn't want to see me either. It was his mother's funeral. Let him deal with it on his own, in his own way. I'd rather be anywhere else in the world than with him, remembering her. Chapter 2 Fourteen Weeks Later The aircraft tipped to begin its descent, and through the porthole I watched the southern side of the island of Sicily emerge from the glare of the sun. Beyond the breaching wing lay a hazy, mountainous land surrounded by turquoise water. Wispy clouds bunched around the summit of Etna, the shadow of a forest creeping up her flank. I saw the sprawl of cities, the pencil lines of motorways, the meandering loops of a river, and the brilliant blue rectangle of a reservoir. My journey was almost over, and Joe was somewhere down there, waiting for me. The last time I'd had a meaningful conversation with my ex-husband was ten years previously, and on that occasion I told him I wished he was dead, and I'd meant it, and he knew that I meant it. I'd watched him implode, emotionally, in front of my eyes. I turned away. I didn't know how I was going to face him again. I didn't know how either of us were going to cope. It wasn't as if we had anything in common anymore, save memories too painful to revisit. I knew very little of Joe's life now, and I didn't know how much, if anything, he knew of mine. He probably didn't know that home, for me, was my friend Fitz's two-bedroom house in Southville, and work, the Special Educational Needs Department of St. Sarah's School, South Bristol. In my spare time, I walked Fitz's dogs, or went to the watershed cinema to watch European films with subtitles. Sometimes I meandered around St. Nicholas's markets and treated myself to a Caribbean wrap and a ball or two of knitting wool, some second-hand books. Most of my energy was taken up with keeping Daniel's memory alive. That was my raison d'etre. I would not let my son be forgotten. Never. It might not look like much of a life, but it was mine and I was happy with it. I felt safe and I didn't have to worry about the worst happening because the worst had already happened. I was doing fine, and if Joe thought I wasn't, well, he'd be wrong. All this anxiety was his mother's fault. Anna De Luca was the reason why I was on this plane and why Joe was waiting for me at the airport in Sicily. She was behind this. She couldn't leave us alone. She had to be interfering in our lives, pulling our strings, moving us around like the pieces on a chessboard. Even now, months after her death. Hadn't she ruined our lives enough already? Hadn't she caused enough heartache? Martha had said Anna's death would be a line drawn in the sand for me. But Martha had been wrong. I thought of Anna's small, heart-shaped face, her black hair, her pretty brown eyes and little white teeth, the peppermints she used to freshen her breath, and the old fury began to rise in me. I was distracted by the passenger beside me, who knocked my arm as he reached for his seat belt. Sorry, he said. So sorry. His jumper slid off his lap and landed on my feet. It was unpleasantly warm. Surreptitiously, I kicked it back towards him. I'm all fingers and thumbs, he said. I don't like takeoffs and landings. Always makes me nervous. He laughed uneasily. I moved closer to the window, turning my body away from his. I didn't like flying either. Last time, I'd sworn never again, and yet here I was, on a journey I hadn't planned, going to a place I didn't want to visit, brittle with nerves, resenting the time and energy I was expending, dreading what was to come, and all because of her, Anna De Luca, and her stupid, manipulative will. The intercom pinged, and the pilot informed us that we'd be landing in fifteen minutes. She said the weather in Sicily was a fine and sunny 25 degrees. Good, I thought. It would be nice to have some sunshine. The British weather had been dull in the week since Anna's death, and I'd been out of sorts. Nothing had gone terribly wrong, but nothing had been right either. I'd felt as if I had a persistent hangover, or jet lag, some affliction that dulled my mind and slowed me down. 
It was knowing that this trip was coming. Knowing I had to use my precious holiday allocation to come to Sicily to meet Anna's lawyer. Knowing I'd have to burn energy dealing with whatever mess Anna had left for me and Joe to clear up. My paperback was on my lap, and I'd been using a photograph of Daniel as a bookmark. There he was, my beautiful boy, sitting astride the skateboard that Anna had bought him for his fifth birthday. He'd been asking for a skateboard for months, begging for one, and Joe and I kept saying no because we didn't think he was big enough, and back then we lived in a tiny flat on the second story of an old house in North London. There was no way I could manage the creaky stairs with a child, a shopping bag, and a skateboard in tow. But Anna being Anna, that didn't stop her. She presented the gift to Daniel on his birthday. His eyes were wide with delight as he tore the paper from the present, its shape and weight giving away what was inside. It was a fabulous board, the exact one he'd wanted. He kept saying, this is the best day of my whole life. Anna told him the skateboard had to stay at her house, close to the park. She also, preempting objections from us, gave him a protective helmet and pads and told him that using the board was conditional on him wearing the safety gear. I could still recall the sinking feeling as I watched Daniel hugging his present, the half-hearted smile I dredged up. Anna's eyes flicking from Daniel to me, delighted at his joy, desperate for my approval, and Joe saying, Wow, that's great, Anna. He never called her mum and then reaching across to take hold of my hand to let me know he knew how annoyed I was. I lay Daniel's picture back in the book, closed it carefully, and tucked it into my bag. The closer I came to seeing Joe again, the more anxious I felt. Funny how it was always the relationships that once were closest that caused the most trouble when they were over. We were lower now so low that details of the landscape were revealing themselves. A water park, a motorway junction, a shopping mall. I saw the shadow of our plane swoop beneath me, a ballet partner mirroring the arc of the real thing. I thought of Joe, waiting for me, and had a rush of nerves. Here I was, a jolt as the landing gear mechanism lowered the wheels. Here we were a groaning of the air brakes. The two of us about to be reunited because of the machinations of his mother. And it was too late to do anything about it now. Too late to do anything but comply. The man beside me was breathing heavily. Oh God, he muttered. Oh God, oh God, oh God. The roofs of the apartment blocks rushed closer and closer, a forest of aerials and chimneys and water tanks. We skimmed the power lines and the tops of the trees. The airport terminal came into view to our right, and there was the bump as the plane touched down. A brace against the forward thrust as it braked. A spasm of relief. Hurrah, the man beside me muttered. He grabbed hold of my wrist. We did it, he cried. We're safe. He was the lucky one. For him, the anxiety was over. For me, it was just beginning. Chapter 3 We disembarked, and I experienced my first blast of Sicily. Hot and dry, streaky with the smell of aircraft fuel. We were shepherded across the tarmac, buffeted by gusts of displaced air. I managed to position myself behind a family I'd noticed at the departure gate back in London. The boy was about ten, older than Daniel had been when he died, but younger than Daniel would have been if he'd still been alive. He was holding his little sister's hand, pointing things out to her. Halfway between the plane and the terminal, the girl dropped her toy rabbit and none of the family noticed. I picked it up and quickened my pace to catch up. I tapped the mother's arm and when she turned, I gave the rabbit to her. She smiled her thanks. I wanted to say something about her son's gentleness and thoughtfulness, about how he reminded me of Daniel but it might have come across as a bit weird. Sometimes when I tried to praise the children of strangers, I went over the top and everyone got embarrassed and it didn't end well. I was glad for that mother that she had such lovely children, 
and it wasn't that I wanted them for myself, only that I wished Daniel was with me. I would have traded the rest of my life if I could have had him back for a single hour, a minute, a heartbeat. It was a hopeless wish, though. All the time in the world wouldn't be enough to compensate for the time that had already been lost. We reached the terminal building and walked through sliding doors into the quiet, sanitized chill of a hallway. We shuffled across a marble floor towards the immigration desks. I stood a little apart from everyone else, keeping myself to myself, and switched on my phone. Amongst the welcomes from various Italian service providers that lined up over the screensaver of Daniel's face was a text from Joe. I'm at arrivals. Okay, fine, don't say hello, or hope you had a good flight, or looking forward to seeing you again. The coldness and brusqueness of the message put me on edge. But what had I expected? Up until Anna's death, all I'd heard about my ex-husband were bits and pieces of information that Martha passed on from Cece. For a year or two after I left Joe, Martha kept trying to tell me about his mental health issues and so on. But I wouldn't listen. In fact, I used to get quite angry with her. Why are you even telling me these things? I'd say. I don't care about Joe. Really, I don't. I knew he was running his own gardening business in North Wales, and as far as Martha was aware, he didn't have a new partner. Like me, he'd never come anywhere close to marrying again. I assumed he was better now. He sounded quite coherent in the emails he'd sent in the past few weeks. Still, this whole situation was ridiculous. It was a stipulation of Anna's will that Joe and I meet the lawyer together. But we had flown in separately and we should have arranged to make our way separately to the lawyer's office in the city of Ragusa. It had been a stupid idea to meet at the airport. It had been a stupid plan to share a car. What on earth would we talk about? How could we bear to be together? I typed a reply. You go on ahead, I'll follow in a taxi. My finger hovered over the send button. I didn't actually know how much a taxi would cost or if Sicilian taxi drivers had the facility to accept card payments. And I didn't speak Italian, so I wouldn't be able to ask. I wouldn't know if I was being charged a fair price for the journey. I didn't even know where Ragusa was in relation to the airport. What if it was 200 miles away? Why hadn't I looked it up beforehand? Why hadn't I thought this through? Did they even have Ubers in Sicily? I deleted the text without sending it. My heart was thumping. My breathing was ragged. I heard Fitz's voice in my head. One foot in front of the other, dear heart. One step at a time. I was desperate for a delay to give me time to collect my thoughts, but was through immigration in record time, and my suitcase was one of the first off the carousel. I extended the handle and dragged it towards the nothing-to-declare lane. The bag was a bulky, difficult thing that kept twisting on its wheels. As I approached the exit gate, I lost my nerve and hovered behind the sliding doors. I looked each time they opened, but I couldn't see Joe in the arrivals hall. Perhaps he was in a different terminal, or perhaps I got the wrong airport. Such mistakes happened. Fitz knew someone who had once inadvertently bought a ticket for Birmingham, Alabama, when she only meant to go to the West Midlands. The doors slid open again. The family from the plane went through, and a cheer went up from the relatives who had come to meet them. The doors closed. I tightened my fingers around the handle of the suitcase. The doors opened and closed, opened and closed. Each time I leaned forward and looked, each time Joe wasn't there. I couldn't stay here forever. Still, I hesitated. The door slid open, and this time a man with tanned skin and short silver hair standing on the far side of the barrier caught my eye and raised his hand. He waved vigorously. I looked over my shoulder, assuming he was trying to catch the attention of someone behind me, but he wasn't. He was waving at me. Was it Joe? No. Oh, God, it was. I'd been looking for the young man I used to know. 
not an older, sensible-looking man wearing a dusty blue golfing shirt tucked into a pair of jeans. The shock unfooted me. Had he been watching each time the doors opened? Had he seen my eyes scanning the crowd, slipping over him without any hint of recognition? Embarrassment heated my cheeks. What should I say? Should I apologize? No, no. I'd blame my eyes. I'd say I was tired. Shit. Come on, I murmured to the suitcase, and I went forwards. Joe wasn't smiling as we walked towards one another. His expression was one I recognized from my work, that of a parent called into school because their child had misbehaved. A parent who didn't want to be there, who'd rather be at the dentist's or unblocking the drains or anything. I was almost sick with nerves myself. At the last moment, my bag unbalanced me and I stumbled. Joe caught me and there was a moment's awkwardness. I assured him I was okay, but still I dusted the place where he had touched me, and he wiped his hands together. We too, who used to spend whole weekends in bed, who had known every tiny part of each other's bodies and used to delight in giving one another pleasure, we had become reticent about touching at all. It was painfully awkward, and so was the silence that stretched between us so far I could feel the draught as metaphorical tumbleweed rolled sorrowfully by. It wasn't a great beginning. I wondered how on earth we would get through the coming days. Chapter Four Can't believe you're still struggling with that old suitcase, were the first words Joe said to me on our reunion. He stared at the case, battered and grubby and covered with stickers. You said you were going to get rid of it after Seville? Oh, Seville, yes. At Seville Airport, I had inadvertently pulled the case over the toes of an elderly man, causing him to drop the duty-free bag he was holding. The bottle of Lafroy contained inside broke, spilling its contents firstly into the plastic bag, and then, when the old man picked the bag up, over his beige slacks, his sandals, his white socks, and the floor. I was pretty sure now that Joe was remembering the smell of whiskey, the redness of the man's face, and his refusal to accept our help or our offer to replace the whiskey. I hadn't thought of that incident in at least a decade, and wished Joe hadn't reminded me of it. A thinly veiled criticism that carried all kinds of subliminal messages about my clumsiness, my carelessness, my inertia. At a time when I was already racked with insecurities, it wasn't a kind thing to do. On the plus side, it was gratifying to find a valid reason to be angry with Joe all over again. Now my ex-husband was staring at my face. If he said anything about me looking worn out or stressed, I would turn around and walk away. Really, I would. Instead, he asked in a grudging voice, Do you want some? And offered me the bottle of water he was holding. He'd obviously been drinking from it while he waited for me because it was half empty. No, thank you, I said primly, and even before the words had been spoken, I regretted them because I was desperately thirsty. We'll get going then. Right. Joe tried to take the handle of my bag, but I insisted I could manage, and then had to pretend I wasn't struggling as I followed him through the arrivals hall. If I hadn't known it was Joe in front of me, I wouldn't have recognized him. His whole shape and demeanor were different. It wasn't just the hair, although his ears were very brown against the silver. His shoulders were broader, and his walk was no longer a relaxed lope, but more of a marching gait. He no longer hunched his shoulders. He no longer dragged his feet. I was probably different too. I wondered how other people saw us, a couple clearly not in harmony, the man walking ahead, the woman behind with her recalcitrant suitcase. They probably thought we were the kind of miserable, long-married pair who had henpecked one another so comprehensively over the years that we'd lost the capacity for humour or kindness. What did it matter? Who cared what anyone thought? I followed my ex-husband out into the brightness of the outdoors and the oven-like warmth. I breathed in the new foreign landscape, herbs and exhaust fumes, a 
dry wind. The suitcase tipped again, and Joe turned. Let me, he said. No, I said tetchily. I can manage, I'm fine. We carried on, he striding ahead, the case bumping in my wake. I followed him past taxi ranks and car parks to the bay where the hire car was parked, small and dusty, one of a number of fiats in a line beneath the twiggy shade of a row of lime trees. The windows had been wound down a couple of inches. The doors to the car beside ours were wide open, and a young girl was sitting in the passenger seat, her bare feet up on the dashboard, staring at the phone she held in one hand while picking at her teeth with the thumbnail of the other. She looked at us over the top of round, pink plastic sunglasses, then turned back to the screen. It's not much of a car, Joe said with a hint of apology in his voice. Or perhaps it wasn't apology. Perhaps he wanted to convey that he was used to driving bigger, better vehicles. It's fine, I said. It was all they had. It's fine. Joe put my suitcase into the boot, and I climbed into the passenger seat and closed the door, pulling it shut with a thunk, just loud enough for Joe to intimate that I was annoyed. Then I wished I hadn't, because he would definitely have picked up on the fact that the almost slam of the door had been deliberate. Or perhaps not. We'd been apart for ten years. He would have forgotten how to read subtleties in my behaviour by now, wouldn't he? My heart gave a flutter of panic. Does he still know me? No, no, of course he doesn't. But what if he... Stop it, Edie, stop, for God's sake. Joe climbed into the car and started the engine. Do you mind if I open the window? I asked. No. You wouldn't rather have the air conditioning on? The window's fine. Was this how it was going to be between us? Stilted conversation and surly, monosyllabic answers. I pressed the button and lowered the window. Warm air rushed in. I glanced at Joe. His face was as rigid as a mannequin's. Fine, good, be like that. We jolted over a speed bump and queued for the exit barrier. Joe was staring pointedly ahead. I rested my elbow on the doorframe and my chin on the knuckles and looked through the side window. Crows were pecking amongst the dusty grass at the verges. We moved forwards painfully slowly. Is this your first time in Sicily? Joe asked. He put on his sunglasses and pushed them up his nose. As I looked at him, I was struck once again by the whiteness of his hair. Last time I saw Joe, his hair had been black and wavy. Before we had Daniel, I used to wash it for him sometimes. He liked me to massage his head, my fingers slippery with conditioner, and afterwards, if the hair washing hadn't led to sex, which it sometimes did, I'd rinse his hair with a shower head and then blow dry it for him. I'd known Joe's head intimately, every lump and bump of it. I knew his hair, its texture and its whirls. In all the time we were together, I'd never found a single white hair on Joe's head. Edie? Joe asked again, definite irritation in his voice now. I asked you if you'd been to Sicily before. Yes, I said. I mean, no, no, I haven't. We'd been planning to come to the island the year Daniel died. He was supposed to celebrate his sixth birthday here, in the villa where Joe used to spend his childhood holidays. Anna and Anna's mother were going to be there, and other relatives from the Italian side of the family who I'd never met. It was going to be a big celebration of a holiday. All kinds of treats and outings and parties had been planned. Picnics and days on the beach, and a visit to a nearby hilltop city to watch a festival. We never made it to Sicily that year, of course, and Joe's grandmother had died soon after, and Joe and I divorced, and all our plans had come to nothing. What about Italy? Joe asked. Have you ever been to Italy? Florence, once, with the school I work at. Right. It was an art trip. Fitz, Miss Fitzpatrick, the friend I live with, she arranged it. We travelled by coach. He didn't respond. We saw lots of statues. Nothing. And churches. I'd been particularly taken by the tiny hidden church of Santa Margarita de Serchi, 
where Dante met Beatrice. I'd gone there with a 15-year-old with a range of disorders who couldn't cope with the organized tours the rest of the party were enjoying. I couldn't cope with them either. Excursions were far more pleasant when it was just the two of us. We'd discovered a basket beside Beatrice's shrine filled with fascinating notes from people pleading for help with their love lives. Some were written in English. Oh, Beatrice, help me. He is my world, but he doesn't even notice me. I know she prefers this other guy, but he's a dick. What shall I do? We'd made up our own responses, matching broken heart to broken heart. Afterwards, we bought ice creams and sat on the wall beside the river. The girl, Kira, her name was, told me about how she wanted to do well in life to prove her mother wrong. Wrong about what? I'd asked, and she'd replied, me being too stupid to make anything of myself. I considered telling the story to Joe, but decided against it. We left the airport and joined a dual carriageway. Cars and mopeds sipped past us. How far is it to the lawyer's office? I asked. About two hours, Joe replied. Oh God, what are we going to talk about for two hours? We should use the time to discuss what we're going to do with the villa, Joe said so promptly that I wondered if I'd inadvertently voiced my thoughts out loud. How else could he have known to answer my question? It used to happen when we were married. One of us would preempt the other's unspoken question with a response. But surely that telepathy born of intimacy must have withered while we were apart. Do you have any thoughts? Joe asked. About what you want to do with your share? Of the villa? Yes, Joe said and I heard the word obviously, even though he hadn't actually said it. If it was down to me, I replied, a quick sale would be best. Do you want to sell it too? I do, yes. Okay, good. Joe was still staring ahead, and I couldn't see his eyes behind the sunglasses. I licked my lips. My mouth was dry as dust. I didn't think you'd want to sell, I said my casual tone disguising how intensely relieved I was at his response. I'd been expecting a battle. I thought he'd be determined to hold on to the villa, no matter what. It was the last strong connection with his mother's Sicilian family, and family was important to the DeLucas. Yeah, he shrugged. Well. I know how much the villa meant to you, all those fabulous childhood holidays you had there. I need the money. Oh, yeah. I waited, but he said nothing more. We drove on in silence. I resumed my original position, staring out of the window, my face turned from Joe, my shoulders aching with tension. We rattled along the slow lane of a dual carriageway and were overtaken by a variety of ramshackle trucks, including a three-wheeler towing a flatbed stacked with tractor tyres. The driver, a swarthy young man in overalls, grinned and saluted as he went past. Joe touched his forelock in response. I had a flashback to a holiday sixteen years previously, when Joe and I spent the summer driving around Ireland in a camper van, the windows open, my belly swelling with Daniel inside it, music playing on the radio, and life feeling so good, so easy. I remembered the braids in my hair, the cotton pinafore I used to wear, the cheesecloth shirt, the sun in my eyes, Joe's hand reaching across the hot leatherette of the bench seat to take hold of mine. How happy we were. The happiness was long gone. Daniel was gone, and our love hadn't been strong enough to survive the aftermath of his death. Now we were merely two people with nothing in common, save an inheritance that had been foisted on us in a clumsy attempt to make up for something that could not be compensated for an inheritance I couldn't wait to offload. Chapter 5 Back in Bristol, when I was planning for this trip, I'd borrowed a linen trouser suit from my colleague, Meg, to wear to the meeting with the Sicilian lawyer. The suit was a mistake. It was of good quality, but it wasn't my style and it didn't fit. Beneath the jacket was a sleeveless polyester shirt with a bow at the neck, I had to hold the ribbons of the bow to stop the wind blowing them into my eyes. Sweat was pooling in the ridge of my back. 
Meg always looked well-dressed. She looked right in her clothes. I'd thought that if I borrowed them, I'd look right in them too. But I didn't. I tucked the ribbons inside the shirt, sweated in the suit, and watched the countryside pass by. Soon we left the flatlands behind and drove a winding road that led into lusher countryside. We passed a hobbled donkey and Joe's fingers clenched on the steering wheel. I remembered something I hadn't thought of in years. When we were eleven years old, Joe and I rescued a starling from a cat and put it in a box in the shed at the back of Joe's family's house in Muswell Hill. Joe looked after it, bringing it food and water, checking on it several times a day. The starling, which we named Stanley, was recovering, and we had hopes of a successful return to nature, until Joe's father, the psychiatrist, Patrick Cadogan, discovered it. Joe and I found Stanley's body on the compost heap. We recognised him by the missing tail feathers. Mr. Cadogan told us he'd found the bird dead in the shed, but he was lying. Patrick Cadogan was a murderer. Joe knew it, and so did I. When Anna saw the starling limp in Joe's hands, I looked into her eyes and saw that she knew it too. That was one of the reasons Joe changed his surname from Cadogan to DeLuca as soon as he was old enough to legally do so. Patrick Cadogan was a cold, cruel man, and Joe wanted nothing more to do with him. To reach Ragusa City, we had to drive through a tunnel hewn through the mountain. After that, we crossed a ravine on an elevated section of road. The drop on either side terrified me, but Joe was oblivious to my discomfort. He had no idea about the dark places to which my imagination had a propensity to turn. But I read the headlines, clear as anything. Bridge failure, multiple deaths, rogue concrete blamed. We crossed the ravine without anything terrible happening travelled a winding road for a while, and then at last the old city of Ragusa came into view, clinging to the side of a mountain, materialising like a dream. It was built so high that its apex was wreathed in cloud. It was a fairy tale city, growing out of the landscape like something organic and ancient, one of its faces lit by the sun, the opposite side in shadow. I stared at it, awestruck, trying to imprint the memory in my mind because I'd never seen a city like it. Did you know it was like this? I asked Joe. Did you know it was this beautiful? I've been here hundreds of times, he replied coldly. Of course he had. No doubt this view was commonplace to him. I wished I'd kept my enthusiasm to myself. We found a shady lay-by at the foot of the city where we could leave the car before getting out, stretching and staring upwards. Anna would have known I would love this view. She would have known the effect it would have on me. But even in death, I didn't want to give her the satisfaction. If she had imagined that bringing Joe and me here together would be the prompt we needed to start dismantling the wall we'd built between us, then she'd been wrong. Joe clearly had no interest in making friends with me, and the feeling was entirely 100% mutual. Joe pulled a jacket from the back seat shook it ineffectually to smooth out the creases and put it on. He leaned down to comb his hair with his fingers, using the wing mirror as a reflector. To one side of us, the seductive city climbed the mountain. To the other, the land dropped away steeply into a shrubby ravine. Goats were grazing in sandy patches amongst the black shade of trees dripping with long, pale catkins. Joe retucked the hem of his shirt into the waistband of his trousers. He had a small belly now that he'd never had before, and I tried not to notice it. I should have bought a tie, he said. I'm sure it won't matter. You don't think it'll look disrespectful? This was typical Joe, becoming anxious, craving reassurance whenever he had any dealings with authority. It was a window back into the past, to the insecure young man who was never good enough for his father who struggled to cope at the expensive and brutal boarding school Patrick had insisted on, who had, right up until Daniel's death, used humour to deflect criticism. Neither of us was laughing now. No, I told him, you look fine. Joe said, hmm, 
unconvinced, and patted his pockets until he found a folded letter with the address we needed on the heading. He tapped the street name into the map app on his phone, and we followed the directions, climbing steeply uphill through narrow, stepped alleyways. Close up, the city was as lovely as it had looked from the road, unexpected views announcing themselves as we turned tight corners, a wall overlooking a ravine with a church clinging to its side, falls of Bougainvillea, swallows feeding above a grand fountain, splashing water poured from the urn of a statue into a great green bowl. Patches of dark shadow, patches of bright light, dappled ground around the trees. Birds sang from their perches on flagpoles jutting over secret squares. Restaurants were tucked behind houses that were stacked tightly against one another. Twisting alleyways barely wide enough for two people to walk side by side. Steps leading upwards or downwards to arched doorways and tiny vaulted bridges. The smell of good coffee. The smell of cooked cheese. Carnations and pegaloniums planted in old olive oil tins spilled red flowers like spots of blood. Caged songbirds trilled from balconies, and washing dried on wire racks hooked to windows above our heads. If it hadn't been for the fact that it was Anna who had brought me to the place, if I could only have stopped myself from seeing the city through her eyes, imagining her imagining me and Joe here together, then I would have been utterly delighted by it. I had to clamp my mouth shut to stop myself from pointing out the wondrous views to Joe. Eventually, hot and breathless, my skin burning and a blister forming beneath the ankle strap of one of my sandals, we found ourselves in the central piazza. In front of us, the steps that led to the doors of the Duomo San Giorgio towered over the square. I would have loved to sit for a while outside the cafe and drink it all in, but Joe was focused on his phone. He shielded his eyes with his hand as he studied the names of the streets that led from the piazza. This way, he said gruffly. I followed him into a shady, cobbled alley lined with tiny, expensive shops. At the end of the street was a sign, Studio Legale Recupero. There, said Joe, that's it. It's very grand, I was thinking. It was nothing like the office of the solicitor who dealt with my side of the divorce. She'd been an acquaintance of Fitz's, and every inch of available floor and table space in her scruffy little back street room had been piled with cardboard files. This was modern and elegant and impressive. Our two shabby reflections looked back at us through the darkened glass. Above us, cameras fixed to the lintel blinked. Joe reached up to straighten the collar of his shirt. Right, he said. Let's get this over and done with. He raised his finger and pressed the buzzer. The door opened and in we went. Chapter Six We found ourselves in an air-conditioned reception area, full of swathes of glossy wood and butter-soft leather furniture. Birds of paradise bloom stood proud above an enormous glass vase beside the desk. We introduced ourselves and the receptionist invited us to take a seat, which we did, sitting awkwardly side by side. I leaned down and tried to adjust the position of the sandal strap so it stopped rubbing on my blister, while Joe fidgeted with a loose button on the cuff of his jacket. A few minutes later, the lawyer's assistant arrived and invited us to follow her into a tiny, darkly mirrored lift. I held my breath and pressed my hands against the wall behind me to prevent any part of my body touching any part of Joe's. The lift was slow and cranky, and I was scared we'd be trapped. I had to stop myself reaching for Joe's hand. Ten years it had been. Ten years, and still my instinct was to lean to him for reassurance. Did the body never forget? The lawyer, Avocato Recupero, was waiting for us in a room on the first floor. He spoke no English, but he was courteous and his tone was kindly. He put me at ease. I could see how he would have appealed to Anna. She always liked nice things, attractive people. I imagined her imagining us meeting him for the first time. 
Go away, I said. Leave me alone. But she was with us, almost as present in that office as if she'd been there in person. Joe and I were shown where to sit, side by side. There was a jug of water on the table and several upturned glasses. I filled one and drank the water so greedily I spilled some onto the faux silk blouse. The spots glared black. I filled the glass and drank again. This time I spotted the desktop with water. What was the matter with me? Why was I being so clumsy? I wiped the desktop with the sleeve of my jacket. It left a smear on the wood. The assistant leaned over and passed me a paper towel, and my cheeks burned hot with embarrassment. Joe was fluent in Italian and talked for some time with the lawyer. I couldn't follow what they were saying, although I heard Anna's name mentioned several times. I sipped my water and tried not to fidget. Eventually the tone changed and the formalities began, and at this stage Joe took the time to explain what was happening. Every so often a document was placed in front of me and I was shown where to sign. That's to confirm your inheritance of half of the villa, Joe told me. That's the transfer of the deeds. That's to say you'll take 50% responsibility for insurance. Every document I signed, he signed too, his name beneath mine, an uncomfortably intimate procedure that reminded me of signing the marriage register, and then later, the papers that would finalise our divorce. The business was completed quickly, more smoothly than I'd expected. When it was finished, the lawyer handed a leather folder to Joe, indicating with a small bow that the bundle belonged to me too. It contained papers, the deeds to the villa and a wallet of keys. Attached to each key with a short length of string was a brown paper label describing the door that it opened. The writing on the labels was sparse and neat. Annas. We all shook hands and the assistant disappeared and returned a few moments later with a tray. On the tray were four small glasses filled with a pale coloured liqueur. We each took a glass. A saluti said the avocado. He raised his glass to me and then to Joe. Congratulations and good luck to you both. I wondered if he'd ever had a couple drink a less enthusiastic toast to their future. Chapter 7 Back in the car, Joe passed the document wallet to me and I held it on my lap. I told the lawyer we wanted to sell the villa, he said. He's going to put us in touch with an agent, but he's already had an inquiry from someone interested in buying it. Do you know who? Some friend of the family. Joe reached for his seatbelt and pulled it across his body. So it shouldn't take too long? I asked. No. And you'll get the money you need? Yes. What are you going to do with it? I asked. He'd been evasive last time the subject was raised, and I wondered if he was intending to spend the money impressing a new partner or something similar. His answer surprised me. I want to help young addicts. Oh? To give them the skills they need to set themselves up for work. Practical skills, I mean. Garden design, landscaping, that kind of thing. Sounds great, I said. And it did. And it was great that Joe was going to use his inheritance for the good. But of all the disadvantaged young people he could have helped, why had he chosen addicts? Well, I knew why, obviously, but it irked me nonetheless. I couldn't help feeling badly about it. So is that it? I asked to change the subject. Are we done now? Can I go home? I'd bought an open ticket, not knowing how long I'd be in Sicily, but the prospect of returning so quickly was enticing. There's still stuff that needs doing. What stuff? The contents of the villa. He glanced to me. We need to decide what to keep and what to sell. You can do that, I said. They're your family's possessions. Joe started the engine and lowered the windows. Some of it's quite valuable, he said. And half of it belongs to you? I detected a note of bitterness in that observation and replied quickly, I don't want anything. Certainly nothing that used to belong to Anna. You decide what to do with it. You'll know what to keep. Joe took off the handbrake and maneuvered the car out of its spot. As we moved, a flock of sparrows fluttered out of the tree. 
tiny shadows flickered over my arms and face. Behind us, Ragusa's walls basked in the golden glow of the lowering sun. There's a particular painting, Joe said. Anna meant to take it to the bank last time she was in Sicily, but she never got round to it. It haunted her. The painting? Why? She'd promised her mother she'd look after it. Is it valuable? I don't know, Joe said. It's old. I'm sure it'll be okay, I said. Yeah, replied Joe. Let's hope so. We drove on. The longer I sat beside Joe in the car, the less I wanted to be there. The prospect of spending days, weeks even maybe, going through his family's possessions, his grandmother's fusty old lady things, congealed pots of face cream and personal items belonging to her and to Anna, things I would not want to see or touch, filled me with dismay. I didn't know if I would be able to bear it. After a while, a thought occurred to me. Rather than us having to do it, couldn't we pay someone to go into the villa and sort out the contents? I asked. Pay someone? Joe sounded as if the suggestion had appalled him. There are people who'll do that kind of thing, look at what's valuable and what's not, and a stranger, you want us to employ a stranger to go through my family's things. Oh, for goodness sake, I thought. You're happy enough to sell the villa. Why make a song and dance about what's inside? Although I was bristling, I continued in a perfectly reasonable tone of voice. Not some random stranger, but a professional. Someone without any emotional connection who could be more objective. Joe frowned. You sound as if you think an emotional connection is a bad thing. I didn't say that, and you know that's not what I meant. I'm only trying to be practical. It would save you having to feel bad about throwing things away. It would be less hassle all round. I promised Anna we'd deal with our inheritance together. Anna scheming again. She thought of every little way to manipulate the two of us. You might have promised her, but I didn't. And it's not like it matters to her now. Why put yourself and me through all that? Joe's hands were gripping the steering wheel, and I knew from his expression that I'd said too much. I should have stopped there, but I couldn't help myself. House clearance experts would sort it out in no time, and we wouldn't have to go to the trouble of hiring a skip or whatever. Joe remained silent while we waited at a roundabout. But as we joined the road that would take us towards the coast, he said, You've changed, Edie. You used to be kind. That was hurtful, but I didn't bite back at him. I didn't want our sniping to develop into a full-blown fight. I'm being practical, that's all, I said quietly. Whatever, he said. I twisted the ribbon of the shirt around my hand. Perhaps he was right. Perhaps I had changed. But if I had, it was because of Anna and what she'd done to me. Grief had made me bitter, and anger had made me harder. But that wasn't my fault, was it? I hadn't asked for Daniel to be taken from me. If I was no longer a kind person, then Anna was to blame. She had ruined everything. We continued in silence. Joe was in a bad mood now, but he hadn't stopped to think how difficult this was for me. I was dreading seeing the villa for the first time, dreading it becoming real to me. I stared out of the window, every atom aching with tension. Chapter 8 Some of Sicily was beautiful, but some of it wasn't. We passed scruffy small holdings, little farms, glossy horses standing in the shade of trees in fields surrounded by dry stone walls, their tails twitching away the flies. We went through ugly industrial and retail estates. We saw car parks and pylons and yellow McDonald's signs and overflowing communal rubbish bins, a giant quarry. I made a mental note of the bad and refused to allow myself to be enchanted by the good. It made me uncomfortable thinking of Anna thinking of me. She imagining how I'd feel when I came here for the first time. I made up my mind not to appreciate any of it. After we'd driven in silence for more than an hour, we crested the ridge of a wooded hill and the sea came into view below us, taking me by surprise. 
a sparkling jewel-green sea that faded into a turquoise haze at the horizon. Wow, I breathed, forgetting to be surly. The light, Joe said quietly. I'd forgotten the light. He slowed the car and pulled over to the side of the road. We both looked over the vista, taking the time to savour it. When was the last time you were here? I asked Joe. Twenty years, maybe? That's a long time. Yeah. The villa's down there, he said, indicating a small headland to one side of the bay. On the other was a larger headland, with a road running along its spine and a little town at the end. I could just make out a harbour, masts bobbing distantly, and a lighthouse that looked as if it belonged on a postcard. We could drive down and have a quick look at what we've inherited before it gets dark. Okay, but Joe, I haven't booked any accommodation for tonight, have you? Not yet. Will we be able to find somewhere? There's a hotel in Porta Serena. Joe nodded towards the town. They'll definitely have room, will they? Yep, he replied. Do you think we should call them now? It'll be fine. He started the engine again and we carried on slowly, zigzagging down the side of the hill until we reached a sharp turn.